an anti-capitalist, uh, there is no choice. Now, um, I have had the joy of friendship with Caleb for a few years now, so have some of you. But I won't, I won't preach to the choir about his brilliant mind, uh, his originality, or his courage. I will say that I've never uh, read, let alone met, anyone living who better combines uh, such eloquence, um, deep learning, and passionate commitment into so timely and powerful a voice. And in fact, it's, I think, the very voice that our country needs right now to break its fever and make up. Now, let's have a show of hands here. I know this sounds random, but who here has ever, has ever stayed up all night? Has what? Stayed up all night long. Oh, yeah. Many times, right? Now, um, so think about what the first sound before the morning is. I'm from the country, so maybe my experience is different than some of yours. Um, but for me, breaking the sounds of the night, there's a new sound that's not the crickets or koi dogs uh, or the owl. It's the first note of the first song of the first bird in the early, early morning. Um, if you're outside, you look at the sky, you see that the stars have only just hidden themselves, and the sky's color has taken on the faintest suggestion of light. Is that that note that you know that the morning cannot be far away, and that nothing on earth can stop the rising of the sun? So my friends, let's hear it for Caleb Moffin. <laughs> Before we begin, why don't we all just stand up and stretch and breathe for just a minute. Stay at your seat and just, just stretch and breathe, right? Right? I know a lot of us have a lot of stress in our lives. Some of us have midterm exams coming up. Some of us are involved in some of the important electoral campaigns that are going on right now. I know some of us, you know, maybe you're worried about paying your bills. Well, you can forget all about that for the next 40 minutes or so. You're safe, and we're just going to have a short conversation about the problems facing the United States of America right now and what can be done about it. So the theme for my presentation tonight is patterns, right? Patterns are all around us. The sun goes up, the sun goes down, the tide comes in. The tide goes out, spring, summer, fall, winter, then spring again, right? Then summer, then fall, then winter, right? Patterns are all around us, and part of the human experience, if you look at history, is people struggling to try and figure out those patterns in nature. The world is so full of chaos and insecurity, but people are trying to find out what they can know is going to happen next, to ha anticipate, to get some security, to get some peace. That's something we've been struggling to do. And one of the things that human beings have always done is they've told stories, right? We know about ancient Greek myths and legends. We know about some of the stories from the Native American tradition, some of the stories from Africa, some of the stories from ancient Europe. You know, myths and legends, stories, they have a special place in the human species. It's part of the way we point to higher truths. And I think that's just as true now as it was in ancient times. And there's one particular story that was written about 80 years ago that I think all of us here should still know pretty well. If I said to you, faster than a speeding bullet, faster than a locomotive, able to leap a tall building in a single bound, look up at the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... Superman! Right? Superman was first written in 1939. My grandparents knew who Superman was, and I think it's pretty safe to say that my grandchildren are gonna know who Superman was, right? It's a story that just speaks to us, right? So Superman, he's an alien from another planet, he's crash landed on Earth, he looks just like any other human being, but he's got superpowers, and he could rule the world if he wants to, but he doesn't. Instead, he lives a humble life as mild-mannered Clark Kent, and he's got those glasses on and no one can recognize him. It's like the perfect disguise, right? And you know, he, he goes around and instead of using his powers to rule over people and to oppress people, he uses his powers to protect the innocent, right? And he's a humble guy. He doesn't like violence. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He just wants to live a decent life and protect those who are in need. Around the world, Superman is actually considered to be a very American story, you know? And that, not just Superman, but the whole genre of superheroes, Batman, Spider-Man, all of that, is considered to be very, very American. And that gives me hope. Because if Americans can love Superman, then Americans can love socialism. Bear with me, that might sound like a shock. 
I told you Superman was first written by two comic book writers in Cleveland in 1939. Well, one of Superman's first actions was to save a group of striking miners, right? These miners were on strike, their crooked boss was looking to go after them, so Superman flies in and rescues them. And those early Superman comics are full of statements against racism and condemning racism and bigotry. Now, today that might sound like just some lame liberal, you know, we hear that everywhere. Back in 1939, when Jim Crow segregation was still in effect and lynchings were taking place, the fact that this nationally syndicated comic book was denouncing racism was a very big deal. And don't forget that during the Second World War, in the radio version of Superman, Superman actually fought the Ku Klux Klan. Right? They, they called them the Knights of the Fiery Cross, and he fought against the Klan. Why? Well, the Second World War was going on, and fascism was the enemy, and the Soviet Union was the ally. And, uh, and these Klansmen, they were admiring Hitler, and they were preaching racism, and they were dividing the country and, and helping the enemy. So Superman went into battle to fight the Klansmen. Who's Lex Luthor? Who's Lex Luthor? So he's a bald guy, a maniacally evil bald guy. He's using technology, but he's not using technology to make a better life for the people. He's using technology so he can rip people off and hurt the community and make, him, make super profits at the expense of everyone else. So basically, Lex Luthor is Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and whenever Lex Luthor Bezos has another evil plot against the people, what does Superman do? He runs into the nearest phone booth, he changes his costume real fast, and he flies in to rescue the people. And who are the people? It's the working class, those of us who just want to survive, those of us who just want a decent life. Does anyone here know how you say the phrase man of steel in Russian? Yeah, and that wasn't an accident. At the time those comics were published in 1939, the Communist Party of the United States had tens of thousands of members. And among the unemployment councils and the labor unions and the anti-fascist associations that they led, they had influence over millions of people. In fact, not far from here, just a few blocks up, begins the district that Vito Marcantonio represented in the U.S. Congress. Vito Marcantonio was a friend of the Communist Party, a member of the International Workers' Order. He represented New York City, Harlem, in the U.S. Congress. Um, at that point, you know, a, a lot of amazing people were associated with the Communist Party. Paul Robeson, a very famous singer. Langston Hughes, in fact, Langston Hughes, the famous African-American poet, for the 1932 convention of the Communist Party, he actually wrote a poem, and it went like this. He said, put one more S in the USA, let's make it Soviet. Put one more S in the USA, oh, we can win it yet. Once the land belongs to the farmers and the factories to working men, the USA, when we take control, will be the USSA then. That was Langston Hughes, and that was 1932. And back at that point, early in the 1930s, the communists were always talking about Soviet America. They had a book toward Soviet America. But interestingly, the leaders of the Soviet Union told them to stop doing that. They said, Soviet's a Russian word. It's not an English word. And if you ever have socialism in the USA, you're not going to copy our system. You're going to do it your own way. It's going to be an American form of socialism. So the Soviets didn't like that. Now, Sometimes the most educational events that you can go to are funerals, right? And I consider it a great privilege that when I was an activist 10 years or so ago in Cleveland, that I got to know some older communists. And there was one older woman who was about this tall that used to go to peace rallies with us. And she was mid 80s at the time that I knew her. And I actually then got to go to her funeral when she passed away and I got to learn her whole life story. She had immigrated to the country from Lebanon when she was like four years old. She lived on the west side of Cleveland and her father lost his job and they were actually kicked out of their home. But then she remembers very vividly, one of her most vivid memories of childhood was when in 1935 when Roosevelt created the Works Progress Administration and hired millions of unemployed people and gave them jobs, how they got their home back, the very home they'd been evicted from, they got back into their home. And I remember riding in, in the car with her to a peace rally and her explaining me and telling me this story about how Roosevelt had gotten them their home back. But then I pressed her a little bit and she said, well, it wasn't just Roosevelt. It was a mass movement of people behind him. And that's why she eventually joined the Communist Party because there was no other organization in Cleveland on the west side in, 19, in the late 1930s that did more to fight for unemployment, to fight for the rights of, of working class people, to oppose racism and bigotry, to stand with Roosevelt. No other organization did that stronger than the Communist Party. You know, at that point in, in world history, 
To admire the Soviet Union wasn't a hard thing to do because at that point we were having the Great Depression in the United States. People were literally starving to death and hungry. But the Soviet Union had gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world to in 1936 they had electrified the entire country, they brought running water to the entire country, it wiped out illiteracy, they had done so much. You know, it's this, this crazy thing, it's like a cliche. You know, people say things without thinking about them, right? They repeat the same phrases over and over. This whole thing about socialism failed, I'm sure you've all heard that, right? Socialism failed everywhere it's ever been tried. The next time somebody says that to you, just say Sputnik, right? You know, who was the first country in outer space? The next time somebody says that to you, say AK-47 rifle, the most efficient rifle in history. Next time someone says that, say Tetris, right? You know, it, it's the weirdest thing. You get people saying, well, in socialism, no one ever produces anything. The Soviet Union produced more steel than any other country in the world. And today, half of the steel on Earth is produced in the state-controlled steel industry of China. So this idea that socialism just doesn't produce anything is absurd. Why is it that all over the world, that all over the world people know about Cuba, a very, very small island? That's because of the medical volunteers that they send all over the world. In fact, people all over the world are studying their achievements. But no one acknowledges this, right? Even, even some of the voices defending socialism, well, they just won't go there. It, it's, it's one of the most absurd things. Um, but I came here tonight to talk about patterns, right? I don't want to get too far into that. So patterns, right? Patterns are one of the most important things in actually in human mental health, according to some schools of psychology. Um, you know, um, I believe classical psychoanalysis tells us that there's two kinds of mental illness. There's neurosis and psychosis, right? People that are psychotic, you know, these are people that are in so much pain and so much suffering that they start seeing patterns that aren't there and trying to create a narrative, like a fictional narrative that they can, they can write up about the world in order to protect themselves from their suffering. And then the more mild form of mental illness that's far more common is called neurosis, right? And people that are neurotic have the opposite problem, right? That's that old cliche that they have about people who make the same mistake over and over and over again, right? They can't notice any patterns. They keep repeating the same mistakes in their interactions with other people and in relationships. And they, they can't notice, they can't learn from their errors. Well, we live in a neurotic country if there ever was one, right? I mean, look at what happened. Like, so do you remember George W. Bush telling us that those poor Iraqis, they were just so oppressed, right? They were just so oppressed. And he just wanted to go invade Iraq, just get those weapons of mass destruction, and liberate those poor oppressed people. But look how Iraq has been ever since then. Can anyone in their right mind say that what the USA did in Iraq was liberation, made their lives better? But look at Afghanistan, right? That, you know, we were told that the evil Taliban is there just oppressing people and it's just so horrible, so awful. Look at Afghanistan now, like Maddie pointed out. It's the center of the global drug trade. Not only is the Taliban still there, we got ISIS, we got Al Qaeda, we got the drug dealers. Has, any, has Afghanistan gotten better because of US military intervention? Look at Libya, right? It was evil Gaddafi. He was making people so miserable. Actually, they had probably the highest life expectancy on the African continent. But, oh, evil Gaddafi was making life miserable. So now look at Libya. Now that Libya has joined the global capitalist system and become part of the global capitalist market, things are so bad that people are getting onto rafts and fleeing in the Mediterranean trying to get to Europe. I mean, this, this notion that the Pentagon is a humanitarian rescue organization that just goes around the world saving people is, is, is a fiction. And I, how many more times are we going to fall for this? But, you know, people are also neurotic, I would say, uh, not people, but the country's leadership when it comes to economics, right? So the first major downturn in the U.S. economy after the Second World War was in 1978, right? And when that happened, Ronald Reagan came in and he said, I'm going to make America great again uh, by, by privatizing things, you know, reducing the role of government, um, uh, you know, attacking labor unions, right? Uh, there, were, there was deregulation and overall the standard of living in the United States started to decrease. And then there was an economic downturn in the 1990s. And again, Bill Clinton, who said he was a progressive, came in, got rid of welfare as we know it, right? He uh, signed NAFTA, a horrendous trade deal that, that devastated not only this country, but also Mexico, Canada, all kinds of countries. Uh, and, and so then, you know, leading up to the financial crisis, and this is the 10 year anniversary of the financial crisis, which I think, you know, the 2008 financial crisis is going to be a definitive moment. I mean, it's definitive for me. I remember being in college and seeing the global capitalist economy collapse and having so many conversations about it. Well, 2008, 
what, what was happening in the lead up to it? So you had Alan Greenspan. And Alan Greenspan was sitting there in the Federal Reserve watching the standard of living in the USA decrease. And he was starting to panic because the spending power of average Americans was going down. People couldn't afford to buy things like they once had. So Alan Greenspan was there in the Federal Reserve and he's saying, you know, we've got to keep American spending. How do we keep American spending, right? You remember after 9-11, George W. Bush got on television. He said, if you want to defeat the terrorists, you got to go shopping. That's what you got to do. You got to go, go shopping, run up that credit card. You got to defeat the terrorists by going shopping, right? That was George W. Bush, right? But not only that, Alan Greenspan legalized all kinds of mortgage lending so people could keep buying houses even though their incomes had decreased, legalized all kinds of credit card practices that had been completely uh, you know, illegal before. The desperation was to keep Americans spending. And what's that about? Well, the reason for that is because at the same time, at the very same time that our standard of living was decreasing, our wages were dropping, uh, the good paying industrial jobs were being eliminated, at the very same time that was happening, technology was advancing, right? The ability to produce products was greatly expanding. A global apparatus of production was growing, right? Human workers were being replaced by machines and now we are producing products more efficiently than ever before in history. Right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing what they have done with artificial intelligence. I mean, they can churn out iPhones and iPads and all kinds of stuff. They've created this global system of production that is producing loads and loads and loads of products with fewer and fewer workers ever before. And this is a crisis of overproduction. And there's a book about it that was written a long time ago explaining it. It's called Capital by Karl Marx. And he explains how the capitalist is always trying to make production as efficient as possible. Hire as few people, pay those people as little as possible, make the jobs unskillable, and this leads to what's called the falling rate of profit, because eventually the people can't buy back the products that they're producing, and you have a glut. The market is full of products that cannot be sold, and this is the built-in self-destruction of capitalism that Karl Marx wrote about. And, you know, right now, Wall Street's doing pretty well. The stock market is doing great, right? And People look at that and they say, oh, the economy is doing well, right? Well, you know, the stock market is doing great. The stock market's rising. And Trump says, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm making America great again. It, it's coming true. Like, I, I'm fulfilling my promise. The stock market is rising. It's happening. But answer this question. Is your life getting any better? No. Right? As our wages go down and so many young people are stuck in low-wage jobs, is your life getting any better? As there's record debt in the United States, I'm talking household debt, I'm talking student debt, is your life getting any better? No. Well, if you answer that question, then you should realize that what we're having right now in the United States is not real economic growth. When the stock market is going through the roof, but average Americans are stagnant and not getting better, that's growth based on debt. That's fake economic growth. And that is the kind of growth that leads to a big fallout because it's not real economic growth. But Trump says, you know, he's going to make America great again, right? And that, that he's going to put this big tariff on China. He's going to cut us out from one of the fastest moving economies in the world. He's not going to collaborate with them on technology. And somehow that's going to make the economy better. And I know there are a lot of people in this country that really want to believe him. They're not here in New York City, obviously, um, but there's a lot of people around the country who are in neighborhoods devastated by opioids, who have seen a rise in crime in their neighborhood, have seen the good paying industrial jobs go away, and they want to believe him. And they, they, they're rallying around him. And there are some of us also, some of us who've gone down that, uh, what do you mind, that Howard's Inn, Cornell West, Noam Chomsky corridor, right? That little rabbit hole. And we know about the history of the United States. And we know about slavery. And we know about the slaughter of the indigenous people. And we know about the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And some of us, when we hear that slogan, make America great again, it just hits us in our gut. It just makes us sick. And we just get angry. It's like, what does he mean, make America great again? Is he going to do slavery all over again? Right? Is he going to do the Korean War again and kill another million people? Is he going to bring back Jim Crow? What is he talking about? Make America great again. It just bothers us. You know, it, it just, there's this rage. You know, all my life, I remember when I was a college student, I would argue with people about politics. We'd be arguing about like the Iraq War or economics or something. And somebody would just blurt out, America's a good country, okay? And I'd be like, what does that have to do with anything? 
right? And they'd be like, well, America, and it's this stupid jingoism that we get in the USA, that, that because of America, because of patriotism, you're not allowed to question the government, you have to go along with it, you're not allowed to oppose capitalism because of this stupid jingoism. And it makes you angry, and if you're somebody who can, you know, can see through the lies, it makes you angry to hear that, right? And that's why a lot of leftists, I think, are out there burning American flags and are out there saying things like America was never great, right? It's, it's, a, it's a reaction, it's rage in response to that stupid jingoism that says you're not allowed to question the government because of American patriotism. You know, but you won't ever catch me doing that kind of thing anymore. And I'm going to tell you why. I'll tell you why. In 2015, I went to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and it was a life-changing experience for me. And in 2015, not only did I get to visit Iran, but I participated in a humanitarian mission. I went on a boat from Iran to Yemen, and it was a boat from the Red Crescent Society, and we were trying to bring humanitarian aid to the people of Yemen uh, who are being bombed, and still to this day, bombed and destroyed by Saudi Arabia. I mean, um, and, you know, I was on this ship for 13 days. And when you're on a ship for 13 days, and you're the only American on the ship, and there's only about 10 people on the ship who can speak any English, um, and you're hearing, you're seeing American warplanes flying above, and you're seeing Saudi, Saudi jets, uh, you know, and, you, and you're hearing reports about what's happening, and you're on your way to a war-torn country, that makes you think a lot. And, and your mind really starts to delve into spiritual matters, and what does your life mean, and what is it all about? And you know, we never reached Hodaida which was the port we were going to. And the reason we never reached it was because they bombed, they bombed the port of Hodaida eight times in a single day on the day we were supposed to arrive. Killed all kinds of dock workers. And on top of that, they bombed the medical university in Hodaida. And they killed medical students who were doing nothing but wanting to help other Yemeni people. And they killed them. And obviously, with the port that we were going to destroyed, and so many people dead and, you know, reports that we would be attacked when we arrived. We had to turn the ship around and we ended up going to Djibouti. And that was quite an interesting experience, uh, my escape from Djibouti. I'll tell that story someday, but I'm not going to tell it today. Anyway, I got back to Iran. And when I got back to Iran, they gave me the opportunity to do something that very, very few Americans have ever done. And I actually got to see the supreme leader of Iran, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Syed Khamenei. And I was in this auditorium with about 20,000 people. And I was about 100 feet away from the Supreme Leader of Iran. That's something very few Americans have ever experienced. And I remember, you know, I was there and I was with a lot of Chinese diplomats and diplomats from Africa and we all had our earpieces on and we're standing there in our suits and we're very formal and some of us had chairs and we're standing there. And usually when I would go to Iran, I was surrounded by like the wealthiest people in the country. You know, like artists, writers, people that worked at TV networks, and people who worked for think tanks. But when I was in this auditorium, you know, with 20,000 people there to see the leader of the Islamic Revolution, I wasn't seeing the, the rich kids of Tehran. I was seeing working class Iranians. And when he came out onto the balcony, when the Supreme Leader of Iran came out onto the balcony, he just walks out onto the balcony, the most gentle, I mean, he wasn't doing anything dramatic, just walks out. This audience just screamed in adoration. And people started sobbing and just sobbing and, and, and moving back and forth. And, and it was like the most dramatic moment when the Supreme Leader walked into the room. And the reason for that was because if it weren't for the Supreme Leader of Iran, these people wouldn't have running water and they wouldn't have electricity. They saw the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, they saw him as the one who fought for their interests against the rich and powerful. And so I stood there in this mausoleum with my earpiece on, and I listened to the speech. And it was interesting, because at the time, you know, negotiations were taking place between the USA and Iran. The nuclear deal was taking place. So I stood there, and I'm listening to the, the conversation. And, um, you know, he's, he's going on. I remember he talked about, he said that we oppose both the crimes of ISIS terrorists and the crimes of police brutality in the United States because they're both the same and you must always oppose brutality. And I remember he talked about, he said that the, the westernized Islam that works with uh, the USA and terrorist Islam are both distortions and we have our true version in Iran. But there's one moment that I will never forget. 
one moment that, that just touched me because he was talking about the negotiations that were taking place between the USA and Iran. And he said that you know, these negotiations are taking place, that he was allowing the USA and Iran to negotiate around the nuclear issue. He said, but the USA and Iran would never be allies, he said. And he said that Iran would never align with American imperialism. And then something happened that I will never forget. As he said that, you know, which is commonly said in Iran, he said that the USA was the great Satan. And then I was the only American in an audience of 20,000 people who all began chanting in unison, death to America, death to America. And I stood there and I froze and, and tears went down my cheeks. I was just overwhelmed. And I think back on that moment. You don't forget a moment like that. You don't. And I stood there and I thought, how horrible it is that this is what America means to people all over the world. They weren't chanting death to my family. They weren't chanting death to people who just want to get by. To them, America meant war. And it meant grinding countries into poverty. And it meant destruction. That's what America meant to them. And when I heard them chanting death to America, I thought, God damn it, how dare these people call themselves America? How dare the billionaires and the bankers that run this country call themselves America? These are the forces that would cut food to children in the Bronx so that they can build drones and destroy people and kill people in other countries. How dare they call themselves America? These are the people that sold America down the river with so many trade deals. They, these people have nothing to do with America. What they stand for is global financial dictatorship. And what people around the world need to know is that there's two Americas. Yes, there's an America of Wall Street billionaires and bankers, of militarists and prostitute politicians, sure. But there's another America. There's an America of people who just want to survive and feed their kids and live a decent life. There's an America of all the people who fought for social justice around the world and stood against empire and war. There's an America of all the people who've organized for women's rights and LGBT rights and so many struggles for justice that have taken place. There's another America. And no, now is not the time to say make America great again. Now is the time to build a new America. I think that we need a government of action that will guarantee Americans the right to education and health care. That's what I think. I think we need a government of action that will, that will nationalize the oil. Right now we're in the middle of an oil boom. You know, they're, they're producing 11 million barrels of oil in the United States, more than ever before. With fracking, there's so much oil. But yet we don't see any of the profits from the oil. The people who get rich from our oil and from our gas are people named like Rockefeller, DuPont, and Carnegie. Well, we need a government of action that will say that's America's oil, that's America's gas, that's America's coal, that's America's timber, and it should be managed and the profits made from it should go to serve the people of America. We need a government of action that will work to provide education and, and actually, you know, there was a time where the United States was churning out some of the greatest scientists and engineers in the world. Why can't we be doing that now? Why are we so focused on bombing and destroying other countries? And why are we so focused? You know, I wasn't going to bring this up, but you know, China is doing this amazing project with the Belt and Road. They're going to developing countries, they're building infrastructure. Just recently, just recently, Trump signed a $60 billion deal, not to build infrastructure here, but to build infrastructure to compete with the Belt and Road. Meanwhile, China has offered, they want the United States to join the Belt and Road, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They want the United States. Rather than join with China's efforts, rather than have win-win cooperation, we're spending $60 billion to help build infrastructure somewhere else just to compete with China, to make it you know, us or them. It's a stupid, stupid idea. But, you know, there's so much that needs to be said here. Eugene Debs, the great socialist leader, he was arrested for giving an anti-war speech. He was put in prison for speaking up against World War I. And the speech that he was arrested for, which he gave, I mean, it's about the 100-year anniversary, contains this paragraph. And I want to read this paragraph from Eugene Debs' speech. And I do apologize. Some of the language here is not, uh, not, not uh, modern. It's, uh, you know, sexist, I guess you could say, but I'm just going to read this paragraph. 
He said, if you want to be respected, you have to begin by respecting yourself and look yourself in the face and see a man. Do not allow yourself to fall into the predicament of the poor fellow who, after he'd heard a socialist speech, concluded that he ought to be a socialist. The argument that he heard was unanswerable. Yes, he said to himself, all the speaker said was true, and I certainly ought to join the Socialist Party. But then after a while, he concluded that by joining the party, he might anger his boss and lose his job. And then he concluded, I can't take that chance. And that night he slept alone. And there was something on his conscience, and it resulted in a dreadful dream. Men always have such dreams when they betray themselves. But a socialist is free to go to bed with a clear conscience. He goes to sleep with his manhood, and he awakens and walks forth in the morning with self-respect. He is unafraid, and he can look the whole world in the face without a tremor and without a blush. That's Eugene Debs. Now, people don't talk that way anymore. And I think the reason you know, that people don't talk that way anymore is because we've lost that notion. He's referring to the idea that people can make themselves better people by being part of a mass movement and organizing to build a better world. That's been lost in our society at this point. You know, people still worry about themselves, people worry how they are, but it, instead it feeds into a kind of chronic narcissism with Facebook and Twitter and, and it, you know, people, people worry who they are, but this notion that we can be better people by coming together and organizing for a better world, it seems to have been lost in our society. And actually, I wasn't sure I was going to do this, but Sander actually inspired me. So, you know, I'm from a small town in Ohio originally. Almost everyone I knew in my little town was Republicans, uh, conservatives. Um, and people there were very, very religious. And I've, I've had a lot of people, when you ask them about socialism or communism, the first thing that they say is, oh, well, you know, that's anti-God or that's anti-Christian. So I wanted to just reflect on that for a moment because, you know, I grew up in a Christian church. I was, you know, I was baptized and confirmed. And when we were getting confirmed, interestingly, we, we took two years of classes. And the first year we read the Bible. And the second year then we learned about the Reformation, Martin Luther and all that. But interestingly, you know, we read the Bible, but there's a couple verses that we missed. Um, to the north and the south, this is one of the verses that we just missed for some reason. To the north and the south, I saw a sign proclaiming death to the weakling and wealth to the strong. Anyone ever heard that voice before? And there's another one that said, there is nothing wrong with being greedy, as it only means that he wants more than he already has. Envy and greed are the motivating forces of ambition, and without ambition, very little importance can be accomplished. Anyone ever heard that voice before? Or the last one, man is just another animal, sometimes better, but more often worse than those who walk on all fours. Four, verse, four Bible verses, I guess you could call them. We never read them, and you know why we never read them in my Sunday school class in Ohio? Because they're not from the Christian Bible. Those are from the Satanic Bible written by Anton LaVey. <laughs> but I do have here with me the actual Bible. And I'll read you what the actual Bible has to say on the issue of socialism. Go now, ye rich, and weep, and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Behold the hired laborers you have reaped in your fields, which you work for by a fraud. And there was a multitude that believed and were of one heart and of one soul, and neither said any of them ought to of things which he possessed or his own, and they had all things in common. And neither among them was lacked, for as many possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and distribution was made unto every man according to his need. Wow. Acts chapter 5. Yeah, and one more. Uh, he, he hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put the mighty down from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled them hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. Now, I know there are people here tonight who are Christians. I know there are people here tonight who are Jewish. There are people here tonight who are Muslims. There are people who have no faith whatsoever. And that's all fine by me. I think religion is a personal matter. It has no place in American politics. However, I'm reading that simply to point out that this notion that one has to be a, to be a follower of Jesus, one has to believe in capitalism, this is false. In fact, I would say based on what I just read you, there is no reason that any follower of Jesus Christ should defend a system where prophets come before people. You know, there's a lot of 1960s radicals still walking around 
And they're a lot different than those 19, you know, 1930s radicals that I just, just got to glimpse with my eyes. You know? you know, you talk to, you know, some of these old 1960s radicals and they say things like, you know, well, you know, if you talk to them about Ho Chi Minh, they'll be like, well, Ho Chi Minh was a freedom fighter, man. He was, you know, fighting against imperialism. So, of course, the American media was demonizing him. But then you say, well, you know, you know what do you think about what's going on now? And they'll say, well, you know, uh, Assad is killing his own people. We've got to invade Syria. And, you know, that Putin, he fixed our elections and, and all of that. And you say, well, you know, didn't, you know they, they lied back then to justify wars. You think they might lie now to justify wars? They say, no, no. You know, back then our, our reporters were a bunch of squares like Walter Cronkite. Now we got hip reporters like Rachel Maddow. She's a lesbian, you know. You know, you know I, I, it's the weirdest thing. But t on a more serious note, you know, there's a, a 1960s radical leader named Jerry Rubin. I don't know if people are familiar. Well, Jerry Rubin, he was being interviewed, and they asked him, what was the greatest accomplishment of the 1960s generation? And he said, the greatest thing we did is we got rid of the World War II mentality. And I hear that, and I think, the, got rid of the World War II mentality. During the Second World War, the United States aligned with the Soviet Union to defeat fascism. There was a feeling that was the beginning of hope for the civil rights movement because there was opposition to racism and fascism in the United States. During the Second World War, Roosevelt was the president and he created social security and unemployment insurance. And towards the end of the war, Roosevelt even called for a new Bill of Rights to guarantee everyone jobs and housing and education. Why in the world would we want to get rid of the World War II mentality? It's the McCarthyist mentality. It's Joe McCarthy. That's the mentality, the 50s mentality that we need to get rid of. And to make matters worse, I'll even tell you this. There was a, a radical group in the 1960s they called the Weathermen. I don't know if people are familiar with them. Well, one of the leaders of the Weathermen was giving a speech at one of their conferences in 1969, 1970. And he said, we want to appeal to the part of every kid who sympathizes with Lex Luthor and hates <laughs> Superman. Well. Forgive me if there's any children in the audience. I'm going to use some hip 1960s terminology and say, no fucking way, <laughs> right? I have no interest in aligning with Lex Luthor Bezos. I'm with Superman, I'm with Roosevelt, I'm with the Soviet people, I am for defeating fascism, and I am for building a better America for the people of the country. <laughs> you know, I, I got to tell you, it's, it's been a quite an interesting evening. You know, a lot of interesting words exchanged. I know all of us don't see eye to eye on every issue, and that's fine. And, you know, I want people to be able to come together, but I must say, as much as I'm opposed to racism, as much as I'm opposed to sexism and homophobia and every form of oppression, I'm not a socialist because I want to destroy the United States of America. I'm a socialist because I want to save the United States of America. This country needs to be saved from the greed of Wall Street imperialism and bankers and bosses. I want a better country and I don't want a violent revolution. Violent revolutions are nightmares. Read some actual history books. Don't watch action movies. Don't watch Hollywood movies that fill you up with adrenaline and make you feel all fired up. Read some actual history of what goes on. When the situation gets so dire that there's a violent revolution, that is a situation none of us ever want to be in. I would prefer very much so that the people of this country come together and peacefully organize and get progressive folks elected and build a better country and, and, and fight against the Wall Street rich in a peaceful manner, right? Violence, violence, left adventurism that they call it, punchism, blankism. If you read some actual Marx, if you read some actual Lenin, you read the writings of Stalin, others, they opposed that kind of thing. They weren't for that kind of thing. The understanding was that Marxists were opposed to violence. They favored a peaceful transition. However, they were not opposed to people's right to defend themselves, which is a basic human right. And if you look at the great revolutions of history, and I, I'm running out low on time, so I don't want to get into all of that, but if you look at the great revolutions throughout history, they're basically acts of self-defense. It's when people are backed up against a wall and have no choice, they defend themselves. And I desperately hope that we never get into that situation here in the United States of America. Now, on that point, I wanted to say there's a lot of people who feel very apocalyptic these days, right? They feel like it's the end of the world. There's a lot of end of the world movies coming out, right? People have seen that. Well, you know, I don't feel like we're in the apocalypse, but I can understand why people might feel that way. I don't know if folks uh, are familiar with the Marxist narrative of world history, but it goes like this, basically. 
you know, for most of human civilization, we were hunter-gatherers. We were in the woods, hunting and gathering. But then with our creativity and our brilliance, we got too good at hunting and gathering. Right? We developed spears so we could hunt those animals very effectively. We were paying attention to the patterns and how berries were growing and fruits, and we knew how to gather very effectively. So with our brilliance, we got too good at hunting and gathering. And there was a scarcity. The animals were dying off. We weren't hunting them. The, the berries and, and all of that weren't growing. And there was a scarcity. It was a crisis. And people started starving to death. It was, a, it was a crisis. And the only way it could be resolved was with the first social revolution. And when we started farming, with domesticating animals and growing crops, right? That was the first social revolution that resolved the first big civilization crisis. Fast forward a few thousand years, right? The, the Silk Road from Asia and the invention of the printing press and other great, brilliant, human, creative inventions made us too good at subsistent farming. We were too good at subsistence farming. And there came a time that people were starving and there was a political crisis. And then we had the second, uh, we had the second great social revolution. We overturned feudalism and we got the capitalist world. And the problem that we're in today is that we've gotten too good at capitalism. Right? They don't even need assembly line workers anymore. We have developed computers and artificial intelligence and 3D printers and the global assembly line is empty of workers and the global market is glutted with products that cannot be sold. We are in the greatest civilization crisis in the history of humanity right now because we have developed the mechanisms to build a beautiful, prosperous world. But the only way we can do that is if the major banks and factories and centers of economic power come under public control and are no longer operated to make a profit for a small group of billionaires and bankers. We need to have control over the economy. The means of production, to use Marxist terminology, must be controlled by the people. And until we get to that point, this civilization crisis that we're in, with people fleeing from developing countries, with wages dropping, with, with opioids, with war, it's only going to escalate until we can resolve this continuing civilization crisis, until we can have popular power control the economy. But I want to back up even further. I want to back up even further because, you know, I talked about human creativity making feudalism no longer sustainable. Well, that really began because throughout the Dark Ages, there was a feeling that human beings were animals. Serfs existed to serve the nobles, right? Commoners existed to serve the king. People were property, people were chattel, and those who ruled above them had no obligation to them. But human history started to advance, and we got to see some great advances in human history. We got, you know, Johannes Kepler and Bach and Leonardo da Vinci. We got all of that when there was a change in consciousness, the Renaissance was created, when there was a change in understanding about how the government should operate. And the feeling was this, that not only did people have to serve those above them, but the government, the rulers, had an obligation to serve the people, right? Populism, that's what populism is. They tell you populism is a bad word. That's what populism is, the notion that the government should serve the people. And that had a lot to do with the founding of this country. What are the first words of the preamble of the U.S. Constitution? We the people. And who is it who pays the taxes that pay for all their ugly wars while our country crumbles? We the people. And who is it who goes and does all the work of this country? We the people. And who is it? Who is it? who goes out and, and, and suffers as they continue to gut the place with their trade deals? Who is it? It's we the people. Well, it's about time we had a government of action that fought on behalf of we the people against the billionaires and the bankers. And I want to just quickly close with this. I like to talk about Superman. I like to talk about superheroes, but please don't get me wrong. The notion that there's going to be some superhuman flying from another country that's just going to come save us all is not what I want you to get out of my presentation tonight. That is not the message. We need millions of people in the United States to start talking about these ideas and to start getting involved in the political process. I could say I think we need millions of supermen and superwomen if we're going to get out of this crisis. I hope you'll get involved, and I hope that you've been inspired by what I said tonight. I hope I didn't go along too long, and I know Paul is going to play another song for us uh, now that I've finished my remarks. So thank you very much. <laughs>